The theme this month is gratitude. And my topic today is grateful just because. Just because. We tend to make gratitude a reaction. We tend to make gratitude a response. Give me something to be grateful for, and then I'll be grateful. (laughs) But it's not incumbent upon me to be grateful until there's something that I have that I feel like I can be grateful for. Now, one of the problems with that is that our perception as to whether or not we should be grateful for something keeps changing. Initially, it's, I have to like it. Yeah. That's usually our initial response. It's, we're meeting great, grateful for it. I got I to gotta like it. Okay? That means it's pain-free, drama-free, guilt-free, according to my plans, fits in with my schedule, Doesn't cost me anything I wasn't expecting to pay or less. You know, everybody's cooperated and it all fits in with my plan. Whoo, I'm grateful. (laughs) We got this long little litmus list here. (laughs) What it's got to qualify before I'm grateful. There's a little itty bitty problem with that. I remember in one of my classes, I often ask people, like, what do words mean? And to figure out where they're coming from. And I said, so what are expectations? What's an expectation? And somebody shouted out, a resentment waiting to happen. We mentioned that we're starting this week the healing our relationships to money, self, and family. And I forgot exactly where I heard this from. And it's been a while. It's maybe a good 10 to 15 years since I heard this. And it is so true. It said relationships fail because of unmet expectations. Relationships fail because of unmet expectations. What I have found is part of the problem with that is that oftentimes we don't even know that we have an expectation or what the expectation is until it's not met. I've done conflict resolution stuff professionally pretty much most of my life. And it never ceases to amaze me when you get the parties there together, what you find out is that the expectations that they had of each other, the other parties had no intention of ever meeting. And a lot of times they weren't even aware that that was, in fact, the expectation. We are running around in life with all kinds of expectations that just bear no reality to anything. And if we want to really get into this thing called gratitude, we have to do this subtle shift from an expectation to just expect and see. This is not just a play on words. An expectation is very concrete. It's very specific. Like we have the idea of how it is to unfold. Expectancy is just anticipation that's open-ended. It doesn't require that it all turn out to be 
a very specific way, but there is an, expect, an, an expectancy there of something happening. Okay? So what is this expectancy of? Einstein said something that I think was just beyond brilliant. He said, the biggest decision you will ever make is whether you think the universe is friendly or not. That's what Einstein said. The biggest decision you will ever make is whether or not you think it is a friendly universe. So here's what happens. Our little human brains are always in judgment. And it's as though life is a court of law. And what happens in a court trial is that you have two opposing sides who before the trial has even started, before there's any evidence of anything, the way the structure is set up is you have the prosecution and you have the offense, the defender, the prosecution and the defender. It's already set up, this court of law. Somebody's trying to prove something guilty and somebody else is trying to prove that it's not. That's the way that the system is set up. So absolutely every piece of evidence that is presented is being viewed through that lens. Same evidence. Same evidence. One side is going to argue this way of how this evidence proves the guilt and somebody else is going to argue how this evidence proves the innocence or at least can't conclusively prove the guilt. Are you with me? Already set up. The evidence doesn't change. Everybody's looking at the exact same thing. But the decision of innocence or guilt is already made before they walk into the courtroom. That's how we do life. That's what this means about is this a friendly universe or not? And the, it, the idea of the expectancy. Are you walking around with the expectancy that it's gonna be hard and everything is against me? Or am I walking around with the expectation that life itself is fundamentally good and that I am a deserving being in life. That I am fundamentally good. Now I know that that smacks at just a couple of theological frameworks. Okay? And I don't know about everybody else, but I was raised very Christian, very fundamentalist, evangelical, charismatic Pentecostal. Now, I don't know what Bible everybody else is reading. I don't know what they're reading, okay? But the Bible that I read says that we come from the one thing that has breathed its life essence into us. That we are representations of this. Not in terms of physiology, but like DNA. You can't be anything your parents are not. That we come from something. We're in this world, but we're not of it. We're from something else. And this fundamental belief here, okay, this fundamental belief is going to make all the difference in the world all the difference in the world. And you say, well, I'm not so sure about this. I'm not so sure that it's a friendly universe. I'm not so sure that, that, that I'm deserving. I'm not so sure. You know what? That's great. 
And that's why I love this particular spiritual tradition. Prove it to yourself. You don't have to come in believing anything. You can prove it to yourself. But here's the caveat. In the scientific method, when you're trying to prove something, you start off with this hypothesis, right? Some kind of idea. You test it. And for it to really be scientific, it has to be repeatable. But here's the thing. If you're going to prove something and you're starting off with a hypothesis, you have to start off with it can be so. That's what you have to start off with. See? If, if I'm trying to prove whether the water boils or not, I have to start off with that. Like this water can boil. And now I get to see if it does or it doesn't. But I have to start off with it can, because that's what I'm testing for. Are you with me? If I'm testing for it can't, then there's no room for maybe it can. Catch that. If I'm testing for it doesn't work, then there's no room for it to work. So all I'm asking people to do is just suspend the guilty judgment for a moment. That's all. I call it the benefit of the doubt. The benefit of the doubt. And I am overly passionate about this, particularly as an African American in this here United States. Okay? Because the benefit of the doubt is not something that's genuinely given to us on damn near anything from intelligence to crime. Okay? The incarceration rate is six times white folks. The arrest record, going to prison, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. But just the benefit of the doubt, okay? Just maybe. So can you walk around with a sense of expectancy that just maybe life can work? Just Maybe everything's not going to hell in a handbag. Just maybe. So if you're trying any of these principles out or whatnot, like just try them. We're really big on affirmations here because the affirmations recalibrate you. The affirmations create new synapses in our brains so that we can actually make a shift. We are hardwired. Whatever we think about consistently hardwires us, and then we can't perceive anything beyond what we've already thought. This is our physiology. Okay? This is why all the time in spiritual traditions, they like practice, practice, practice. You have to repeat it and repeat it. And how, how many times do I forgive? 70 times 7 is what Jesus said, which is this metaphor that says it is repeated and repeated and repeated because that's the only way you're going to get it. That's the way you're ever going to learn it. Okay? And if you aren't consistent, you will revert back. I don't care how much you work out and you get fit and trim. If you stop that, you won't be. I don't care how good of a player you are at basketball or tennis or anything else. You stop practicing? Game off. You're a dancer, you stop dancing. You're a singer, you stop singing. You're a person that you say you're a loving person, but you stop loving? You say you're a creative person and you stop creating? The mojo stops. But the good news is that if you stopped, you can start. You stopped you, you can start you. That's the good news. This is the good news. The gratitude is not on the back end. It's on the front end. This is true with all the spiritual qualities. It's on the front end. 
If you begin with gratitude, guess what? You'll see more things. If you begin with gratitude, you'll feel it. If you, I can't, I cannot say this enough. We have to choose to live in alignment. If you wait to feel like loving, you are going to wait. (laughs) If you wait till everybody acts right before you choose to forgive, oh baby, you're going to (laughs) wait. If you're waiting for life to give you permission, You're going to wait. You're here. That is the permission. You're here. You're here. And that's enough. Enough. It's enough. It made me flashes now of this conversation I was having the other day with somebody about this pulpit. How this congregation that built this church was the same denomination that I grew up in, but they split in the 1920s on racial lines. So the white people became assemblies of God and the black people became the church of God in Christ. They've since reconciled in the 90s and are teaming up together so that the white people are funding these urban ministries to train people how to be street ministers. Because black folks don't go to Bible college. Most black preachers have never been to seminary. Um, So they're doing this teaming thing. But this pulpit is one of the places that the quote-unquote ex-gay movement started. The pray the gay away thing. Literally, right where I'm standing, right here. Um, Kim Clark was just up here. And she did a beautiful movie, she and her partner, called uh, God and Gays, the movie. And we toured it around the conferences when an Interlight, you know, participated in that. And, and Reverend Darlene Bogle, who was that minister, I call him the ex, ex-gays. Um, <laughs> the folks who finally figured out it doesn't work. And that entire Exodus International closed up about two or three years ago, and they apologized to the world. (laughs) Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But I know what that's like. Just at that age, at the tail end of the baby boom, where growing up in the tumult of the 60s and the 70s, was just one thing after another after another. It's the civil rights movement. I'm in Los Angeles, Wax is blowing up. You know, my dad's pharmacy burnt down. It was a good thing he wasn't in it anymore, but it burnt down to the ground. You know, watching that city go up in flames all the time. It's the feminist movement. You know, my friends are going off to Vietnam. I mean, it was just like so many things going on. Stonewall is happening in the gay movement. It was like there was just all these reasons. Why not me? And I learned early on, you can't wait for God. Don't wait for God. God's waiting for you. Don't wait for God. God's already done it. God's already put everything already here. There's not going to be more music next year. There's not going to be more love next year. There's not going to be more peace, more power, more joy, more... There won't be anything more. It's just a question of will there be more people expressing it. There won't be more. 
It's already here. We just have to give ourselves permission to, but we won't get there with the lack and limitation and the scarcity consciousness that takes us out of gratitude. The judgment, the resentment, the blame, the shame, the guilt, the de -de 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 it takes you out of gratitude. That sucks your energy. There is not a bigger energy sucker in the world than a lack of gratitude. I'm telling what I know. And there's nothing that turns you around any faster. There's nothing. You don't even have to believe it. It's a friendly universe and all the rest of that. You honestly don't. You can be an atheist. You can be a non-believer. You can be three years old. What do we do with children? When they start getting into the, yeah, I don't know if this is not good. And, you know, and the dog kicked me and nobody likes me. But what do we tell them? Be grateful. Be grateful. Because that's a rabbit, that's a rabbit hole that just sucks you all the way down. Be grateful just because. Just because. Because life is in session. Just because. Why should you love? Just because. Just because. And what's the choice if you don't? See? This is my Reverend Deborah litmus test of everything. What happens when you get more of it? We live in a universe that multiplies. We live in a universe that's constantly producing and reproducing. So when we're clinging on to something, whatever it is, an attitude, a belief, well, this is just me, or I have a right to be angry, yeah, you got a right to be angry. Sure. I got a right to go through that intersection when the light's green. Guess what? I could be dead right. You got a right. You got a right to be mad. Sure. How's it working for you? <laughs> and what happens if you get more of it? See? If it contradicts the fundamental harmony of life, it does not belong to you. I don't care how long you have thought it, how long it's been in your body temple, how long it has been in your body of affairs. If it contradicts the fundamental harmony of life, it is not yours. You are like a dog carrying a flea. There are parasitic stuff that sticks to us, like mud on the windshield or something. Wipe it off. Clean it off. Claim who you are underneath it all. See, too much hatred, you'll get sick. Too much resentment, that'll get you. Nobody's going to die of too much joy and love. <laughs> too much creativity is never going to kill you. You will not overdose from gratitude. You may get a little high. But you won't be taken out on a body bag. What happens when you get more of it? And gratitude is one of those things, I guarantee you. If there's anything in you that is willing, and I tell you where I learned this the most, not in church. I learned it in prison, not as an inmate, but in prison outreach. 15 years I've been going inside. And you know how passionate I am about that. Because the lifers in particular have been my teachers. To watch people who are locked up for life. Being some of the most grateful people I have ever met. Seeing what it means, like man's search for meaning. 
You know that book that Frankel wrote that I remember reading back in college? Uh, he, he was a Holocaust survivor. And he was talking about, like, how do you find meaning in all the, 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 the smoky stuff? If you talk to any survivor of anything, this is what they're going to tell you. That at some point they got to a place of gratitude. At some point, if it was no more than just being grateful that they were alive. Of walking around with an expectancy every day. That the world can't take me away. The world can't take away my joy. Because it's an inside job. It's an inside job. And I challenge everybody. Whether it's gratitude, love, trust, hope, joy. Put it on the front end if you start with it then that will be your experience you can't wait for stuff to happen see if you like it to see if i'm going to have joy and trust and love start out with it i'm about to end soon i promise <laughs> for some reason that truly escapes me Everything that I teach about spiritual qualities, everybody understands in the negative. No argument with me ever in the negative. So if I were to say, you know what? If you start your day with anger and judgment, guess what? What's going to happen? See? Nobody disagrees with that, right? But if I were to say, if you started your day off with love and gratitude, guess what would happen? <laughs> Boo. I don't know what. <laughs> we know this. Right? We say grateful just because. Right? Don't we know people who are grouchy just because? <laughs> They're ugly and hateful and disappointed and rude. And just because. Nothing in particular has happened. They walk through the door with it. Yes? Do they need a reason? No. And we know that being in that space just creates more of it, right? News flash. It's the same way in the affirmative. It's the same way in the affirmative. Just as a grouchy person walking in the room is like a cold front. <laughs> walking through the room. Somebody who is upbeat and cheery and grateful. Whew, it's like a warm breeze. Yes? So are you going to be a cold front or a warm breeze? Okay. Are you going to freeze your own life? Choice is ours. All the time. Just try it. Just. I'm going to be grateful. Just experiment. Just see what happens. I'm going I'm, 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 I'm to end on this. I, I, I love it. I saw this. this I've, I've shared this a couple of times. Um, like little poster thing. And it's a prayer. And <laughs> it starts off. It says, Dear God, so far today, 
I haven't been grumpy or irritable or self-centered in any way. And for that, I'm really grateful. But in a minute, God, I'm going to get out of bed. (laughs) And from then on, I'm going to need a little more help. (laughs) I turn to the divine for help with my gratitude. Let's pray.